everybody, I'm Eric Brown here. I'm a software engineer at Adobe. Let's break in. This is Ruben Harris. I'm here with the homies Arthur and Timor Meister, and this is the Breaking Stars podcast. Timor, can you please tell the people what we're doing today? Yeah, so it's a Tuesday afternoon, and today we're recording out of Adobe. Um, the fun fact is that Adobe is like a block away from our house, and five years ago when we were planning our career transition into tech, we never would have imagined that we would l literally be living within a block distance of Pinterest, Stripe, Adobe, and here we are. Like We can literally walk in and interview great guests um, on our podcast, but it's enough about us. Uh, it's about our guests. So, Ruben, can you please introduce them? Yeah, no, it feels good. Um, and before introducing today's guest, I want to give a shout out to Tony Brown, uh, who was introduced to us through Nate Jones. We're here with his brother, Amir Brown, who uh, many of you know as a top software engineer here at Adobe, and we're going to talk about what it takes to be a successful engineer at Adobe. But something that you may not know is that, like me, um, he and I are both um, party organizers. Um, he's taken it to another level to where he owns his own spaces. He was a journalism major, an econ major. He's a family man. He spent time in New York and Florida and all kinds of other things that you're going to le learn about. But before going in on that, let's just say welcome, Amir. Howdy, everybody. Uh, thank you guys for having me, bringing this start Welcome, welcome. Yeah, uh, man. You know, welcome. Looking forward to it. It's been a long time. and it, it's, it's awesome to see your progression. Like, you're on stages everywhere. Um, you're, you're doing concerts and things like that. But before, you know, going into that, why don't we start off by just talking about, like, what uh, a software engineer in your category does on a day-to-day -day basis. I think you're the first person that does uh, QA work, I believe. Yeah, yeah. so um, software quality engineer. Um, essentially, there's two types of quality engineering. There's black box testing, and then there's white box testing. So mm -hmm. black box is um, basically you don't have uh, foresight into the code base. You're just using it and you're testing it from a user perspective. Um, but you have to have an eye and have an understanding of what you're actually testing, like the functionalities of the product. Mm -hmm. But you don't, you, this is not a code level test, right? Mm -hmm. And then white box testing, there's a UI automation test and then there's unit testing that we use here. And um, unit testing basically makes sure if you have a function and I'm going to give an input and expect an output, I'm testing that what I put in and what I get out is, is what I'm expecting. And a UI automation test basically is you coding using uh, something called Selenium. Or then there's a lot of frameworks that use the Selenium web driver. Um, which is, we use Nightwatch JS and basically acts like a user. So you can literally write a test to do the functions that a user would do. Yeah, Got and it. I think a good maybe comparison for the folks who are just tuning in uh, would be like if we're building a car, um, there's people who come up like with the architecture of the car, but then there's also people who ensure that um, like the engine works the way it's supposed to be working mm -hmm. before it leaves the production line. Right. And it sounds like the, the white hat testing is the one where you actually like write tests to make the engine fail or act a certain ways right. and then you ensure that it could hit like certain capacities right. and it's not going to break down when the user is using it right? right exactly like if i um if i'm if i put in blue and expect blue to come out mm -hmm. and I, in my test i'm going to i'm going to give blue and i'm going to say mm -hmm. if blue if i get blue then this test pass and if i put in red i expect my test to fail yeah and like that will, will pass expecting it to fail yeah. so you know it's just kind of like just covering your code base just making sure every type of edge case or any type of possible bug is uh addressed and the tests are passing according to how you wrote them yeah yeah, yeah. And, and we're gonna definitely go in on like what it's like to work with like designers and other people in roles on your team um i mean we can go into that now like so at, since since you're doing all this type of testing how do you work with the different people on your team on, on in at adobe right so um kind of outside of the engineering space, you obviously have your product managers, you have your directors, and everybody's setting the direction of the of what you're gonna be building. Uh, then you have your UX designers and your graphic designers, people basically 
putting together what this is going to look like based upon what the leadership has said we're going to build. And then at that point, and obviously engineers have a say in all of this from inception on, but at that point, once it's what is it, once it's buttoned down to this is what we're doing, this is what it's going to look like, those specs are passed on to engineers to then go in and, and make the experiences real. Um, people that don't know what specs. Uh, so it could just be design specs, it can be code specs, um, it can be uh, feature specs, just basically what, what we're going to be, what what, ex- what exactly are we building here, um, and to what schematics are we going to do, uh, what's the stack going to be, like what type of technologies are we using, third-party technologies, proprietary technologies are we going to use to make this happen for us. Got it, got it. And I think that's, that's something that's very um, interesting about Adobe is not just the way you all work within Teams. Um, but you all are very proactive about talent development, creative development, and recruiting people. Um, and you came through a process called Adobe Digital Academy. Yep. That was a pilot at the time that nobody knew about that's not formalized. Mm-hmm. So um, before going into your story and that, kind of give people an overview on what Adobe Digital Academy is. Uh, it's a basically a career accelerator, a transition program for um, people who are technically underrepresented in the tech space and want to bridge that gap from their previous careers into a new career in technology. Got it. And so um, something that we've talked about a lot recently on the podcast is like corporations building talent versus buying talent. So Mm -hmm. like historically, you know, people are still doing this. They'll like recruit from schools and from other people that are already experienced, but now they're like jointly selecting people in programs and choosing to develop them. And so at the time, you were thinking about boot camps um, to learn because you were thinking about a career switch. Mm-hmm. Um, so how did that process go? Like you, did you know about Adobe Digital Academy then or how did that go? No, I didn't. Um, so I knew about General Assembly because I actually took a General Assembly course after I graduated college in 2014, a digital marketing course. Uh-huh. So I knew that you know this, this place existed and they had different programs. And even then I wanted to take the coding course, but I didn't, I just, I just deferred away from it yeah. and took the marketing course. Cause I thought that would double down on my degree and like, you know, it would be, you know, make me more hireable. I was not taking a lot of risk at that point. Um, but I knew about General Assembly fast forward. Um, you know, when I decided to actually apply to GA, I just knew that everything they had to offer. I was familiar with the space and the outcomes of the of the programs and just wanted to jump in head first. Yeah. Got Can it. you take us to the moment when you decided to actually apply to GA? <laughs> yeah. Because I think there's an interesting story around that. <laughs> yeah. So um, a little backstory is I was working in, in New York at a, at a planning and buying agency on their business development team. Um, I left there to in search of a higher paying role out here, which I found, but it was a, a straight sales role at a tech company out here selling a data platform. And I just found myself doing something I really didn't want to do. I found myself in a place that I didn't expect myself to be in, which was, you know, not not struggling to get by, but definitely like fighting and clawing to uh, stay sustainable and doing something I didn't like. And I was just like knew that I was at the time I was 25, 20, I was turning 26 years mm-hmm. old. Like, so on my <laughs> funny story is on my 26th birthday, I quit my job. Um, I went to LA, was, saw Kobe Bryant play in his last game. <laughs> my brother, shout out to my brother again, he bought yeah. me some tickets. Okay. And, uh, you know, he went to go do some meetings because he was working at Goldman Sachs at the time. And I just went to, uh, what was it, not Santa Monica. Uh, Malibu. I was oh, yeah. in, he was, we were in Malibu. He was at a yeah. client meeting. I just went to the beach and it was just like, man, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going back there. Like I'm not going back to work. I did yeah. wind up going back to work. Um, just to let them know this guy, I kind of like came back to myself and yeah. went to be respe- re- you know, respectful and responsible. Yeah. And you Can know, you take us back. Cause I think a lot of people find themselves kind of stuck in a profession that they're not interested in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, did you have any hesitations, uh, around leaving? What are you going to do next? How did you approach doing that? You know, I just, I just had this just like revelation that my life is my life and like my time is my time. My mm-hmm. breath is my breath. My experience here is my experience here. And, you know, whether I'm going to fly or crash, like I'm going to do it in the way that I feel like is best for me. And like, yeah. that was it. It was once I was convicted of that, I was, that was it. You know, yeah. and so I think a lot you, of, I think a lot of people resist uncertainty, but uncertainty could actually be a good thing because it pushes you outside your comfort zone yeah. and then you open yourself up for opportunities that you never even knew existed yeah yeah 
Yeah. Like when I when I found myself back at home, you know, I I left the job. Uh, you know, they respectfully let, like and told me, you know, go ahead with good graces and it's all good. We had a drink, and I found myself back at home. I was happy, but then I got there, I was like immediately anxious and nervous. Yeah. Like, oh crap! Like, I just I just left my yeah, job. What's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how did you? Uh, kind of end up choosing software development because um, for folks outside of tech, it could be scary, like mm-hmm. engineering, you have to go to school, get a four-year degree. How did you approach navigating that space and ending up uh, choosing GA? Yeah, um, well, I always knew I wanted to get into technology at some at some point. And I knew it was daunting to me and I knew I wanted to get in like head on. Like I didn't want to just kind of tippy toe and I was mm-hmm. just like, man, I'm going to go at the base of it and whatever the career ends up being for me, at least I'm going to go in at the core. Like I want to learn how to code. That's yeah. what the product is. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I kind of got into that from, from watching the social network when I was yeah. 16 and et cetera. And like, so this is all like a culmination of a bunch of years of just like wanting and hoping and then finally just having the gumption to do it. Just mm-hmm. apply and like go in and learn the skill that you need to learn. Why did you do a journalism econ major in the first place? What, why was the general assembly G- general journalism like oh journalism something else like before <laughs> that, so like. oh you know it's like i'll take it i mean i'm gonna be re- very honest with you it was just leaning on what i considered my strongest skill sets that i didn't have to develop interesting it's just yeah. you know what what can i do well, i can definitely go to journalism school i can definitely write and communicate yeah and i can definitely um have a career in public relations advertising you know those jobs when yeah. you it's like hey if you have a degree in communications public relations yeah. advertising marketing anything <laughs> that can <laughs> journalism if you've ever ever written an essay this is a job for you you know yeah, yeah. i was just like you know I, I can i can work in that space like yeah. i can find myself being creative yeah. I, I thought i was going to be um like what's his Mel Gibson from yeah. What Women Want? <laughs> that, that's what I was gonna be. I was gonna yeah. graduate, go to Madison Avenue, become uh, mad <laughs> you yeah. know a madman. Like, <laughs> but um, you know, I realized that that industry is not what I thought it was gonna be. Yeah. yeah, and it's a long climb from the bottom to the top. And once people get to the top in that industry, they tend yeah. to stay there for a long yeah. time. Yeah. Um. So yeah. But what's, what's interesting your, is the that the journalism and New York played a factor after you made the decision mm-hmm. to learn how to code yep. in your like application process that you didn't even realize. There was like something that happened when you yeah. started applying. So um, I applied to General Assembly and they, you know, they just wanted us to write an essay about ourselves, our background, why we wanted to get into tech, uh, you know, what motivated us, what, you know, what our fears were about coming to tech, et cetera. It was a very vulnerable, um, transparent essay. So I wrote an essay called, uh, Techmatic Silicon State of Mind, <laughs> like, like Illmatic, <laughs> like Illmatic. I actually referenced it. Um, in the, I started it out by saying in 1997, Nas did a double XL interview uh, where they asked him, "What does Illmatic mean to you?" And he was like, "Illmatic, it's like iller than ill. It's the illest you could be. It's like it's it's, it's supreme ill. You yeah. know what I mean?" So I referenced that and said, "Yes, you know, I, when I wrote, I labeled this techmatic because I want to be tech. I want to be techer than tech. I want to be supreme tech." I like that. I like that. And then <laughs> yeah, like you yeah. named the, the whole essay Silicon State of Mind, which is based off of New York State of Mind, which yeah. is a good song. And but like going into the thing, there was like they told you about a, a opportunity hub. Yeah. Scholarship, so or like what? General Assembly has this opportunity fund where Queensbridge Ventures, which is Nas's um, venture firm, um, mm-hmm. they are a funder of the opportunity fund mm-hmm. along with a bunch of other companies. Interesting. Yeah. So Adobe actually was a partner of that fund as well, but I didn't know this was a new partnership mm-hmm. that wasn't even on their website yet. So uh, me trying to be strategic, I'm angling into you know one of the funders that I really wanted to. I, I had this idea like Nas is gonna read my essay, he's yeah. gonna hit me up, bro. It's gonna be dope. <laughs> but I, I was like really angling in. I was like, whoever yeah. reads this, if you know, if yeah. they know anything about the Opportunity Fund, then they know Queensbridge Ventures. Yes, yeah. Is, yeah. Is and Nas. you did your research ahead of time. Yeah. yeah. And what uh, what else did you put in that essay? Because it sounds like you put a lot of thoughts around like technology, like your goals. Yeah. And what uh, what else did you include there that you think caught the attention of the people that gave you the scholarship? Uh, I told them about this uh, app I was going to build when I was 16, even though I didn't know that code called School Days. And that was after watching... Um, Spike Lee's joint. Yeah, well, it was after, after watching The Social Network. Oh, but it yeah, was yeah. based off of the name School Days. Got it, got it, got it. Um, that's from Spike Lee's movie. But uh, I basically was going to build this like high school com- like com- comparable version of Facebook. But you know, I never did that. I didn't even know how to code. I was 16. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's dope. Nice. That's dope. We'll definitely make sure that we send it over to Anthony Soleil, who's a nice manager. But, you know, now that you're, you know, you got, at the essay must have been really good because you mm-hmm. got accepted. Then what happened? Uh, so from there, you know, I was actually, 
uh, I, I was, didn't have a job, obviously. I was just waiting to get, to get into General Assembly or waiting to see what was going to come about. And I actually had a, uh, a loan approved for me to pay for General Assembly sitting there ready to go. Uh-huh. And I was up in uh, like Lake Shasta area, just okay, chilling yeah, yeah. out. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and cause, you know, I had some time on my hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I got an email from General Assembly saying like, hey, Amir, like we want to introduce you to Liz Lowe. She's the head of the Adobe Digital Academy and they're interested in funding your General Assembly education. Dope. And then in comes Liz and I get an email from the official Adobe group and I was just like blown away to see General Assembly's logo on a paper with an Adobe logo <laughs> addressing me saying that they wanted to pay for my education. And I just you so know, it's like no interview. They were just like, "Yo, essay fire!" Like that's we're it. gonna fund you. That's it. Like they they reached out to me and just told me. Like, and you didn't even know that like that was like gonna happen. I didn't apply to Adobe at all. Were I just, there any strings attached? Or I, I, that's what I asked them. <laughs> 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 no, so yeah, just no strings attached. Uh, just we are fun. We're starting this program. We like your essay. We like your passion. Uh, can you hop on a phone call with us? So Dope. I hopped on a phone call. It was, a uh, you know, just kind of doubling down on what the essay was about and like, you know, some of the questions I answered and my background and why I wanted to transition. And from there, uh, I got another email saying like, you know, this is when you start and this is like when you start general assembly and everything's paid for and we're going to give you a living stipend. Wow. So we're make sure your rent's paid and, you can eat you can eat and you don't have to think about those things and like just go all all the only thing that you have to do is learn how to code wow and so that's a that's a huge change to the things that you were worried about before so before going into the, how that changed things while you were learning talk about the things you were worried about before. before yeah i mean you know advertising is one of those industries where you can once you get to the top you're good but when you're at the bottom and you're like you know getting into your career it's, it's kind of it's not it's not super lucrative um just paying your rent you know getting gas, uh, getting food, like, you know, going out to hang out with your friends, taking a flight, you know, to, taking a trip. Like, those are things that you have to, like, really think about and plan. Uh, you stopped, obviously, like, no one's rich here, but, like, you have to really, really plan. There's no spur of the moment, and, like, everything has a cost, has a has a uh, repercussion of some sort. Every dollar you spend is being taken from somewhere else. So, you know, it was, a, it was to a point where, you know, I couldn't even really automate my bills. Like, I couldn't put my utilities and my rent and those things. Just like, hey, just take it out when it's due, you know, like, it'll be there. And just now, you know, transitioning into a, basically a new lifestyle. It's just those yeah. things are those So let, things let's are talk about of. that because two years ago, you're now 28, you mentioned. 28, right? yeah. So two years ago, you quit your job. You t- told them that you have like a, a bigger vision for yourself. Mm-hmm. So now fast forward two years later, you're an engineer at Adobe. So I think the ad job was like 40 racks. Yeah, it was like New 45. Yeah. 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 Uh, 40 so 40. it's like a 180 pivot, yeah. 180 degrees pivot. And uh, just talk to us about like i guess for, for people who are listening a lot of them are considering tech but talk about like in what ways did your lifestyle improve what are some of the ways that kind of i guess you seem more fulfilled but mm-hmm. like tell us like what do you find more fulfilling about this role versus your other jobs that you had before this role is about the product it's about building software that's it mm-hmm. it's not about what you look like it's not about what you like to wear it's not about what time you actually walked into the building i remember like walking into my old job five minutes late and like having to walk past the director's desk and him just looking like it's 908 like you know versus like here no politics no, yeah oh, nobody's yeah. nobody's looking for that here it's like basically they we want to build great great quality products and keep our customers happy and make sure that the workspace is respectable and that's it and like everything else is about delivering high quality products as long as you deliver with your time yep mm-hmm. then you're good yeah we work in sprints so it's like you know we have daily stand-ups where we're you know checking in with each other this is what i'm doing we're holding each other accountable but after that it's like i don't care if you're sitting on a beach or sitting in the office or sitting in a closet like if you're checking in what you need to check in and the prs are flowing p- p- the pull requests are getting you know merged into the code base and everything's good and yeah you're yeah. being accountable then that's yeah. it what about so, your day-to-day how is that different than um kind of the types of problems you're solving yeah. or like the types of work you're building um yeah i mean it's just i'm always learning mm-hmm. so in my role i've went from black box testing to white box testing or even in my internship building a analytics dashboard like i've been just touching all different parts of this process creating test plans um onboarding new qes and qas into the product giving them a lay of the land of how our continuous integration works because uh continuous integration is basically like imagine if i have this one 
like master line right here and I have all of these different branches off of that master line like merging into this one master line yeah. and we have imagine if each one of those branches had another like branch off of it so continuous integration is taking all of these code changes from all of these different uh, sub modules into the uh, your your main branch into your master branch and pushing that into production yeah and well, just like explaining those things I've, I've learned so much so my day-to-day yeah. -day is about testing it's about white box testing uh, but it really is just about continuous learning. Yeah, and so let's let's unpack the general assembly experience. Cause mm -hmm. like you're in there, you got the stipend. Mm -hmm. Like, what's that day to day? Like, was it psychological? Was it hard? Because I think this is the first time we really talked about general assembly. I think mm -hmm. general assembly got acquired for four hundred million dollars mm -hmm. specifically by Deco, specifically mm -hmm. for corporate education yeah. and training. And that's what you're you were in. So from your perspective and being one of the first people in the pilot program I think like it ended and then there was a restart and like there's yeah. a bunch of stuff happening so let's let's walk through that yeah so the day-to-day -day in, in general assembly is just grueling it when you first when you first like realize the time commitment in the in the energy that you're gonna have to put out it's like daunting and grueling uh, the first week is great because you're like oh I'm doing something new I'm learning this is cool like and then once those projects are due you know you, you really have to put your, your your foot to the gas and like keep your head down so I had to sacrifice a lot of like extracurricular um, I had to stay up a few all-nighters just to make sure I had my project done because at this point it's not just on me like I'm being funded by Adobe I, they, I can't waste their time their money I can't waste my time my money um, in general so you know that was that was like one of the biggest things for me is just to get my mind right like yeah. you said you want to do this then you got to do this like for real and like this is what it takes like you're gonna miss things you're gonna miss sleep and like you get your stuff done and you need to learn and you had your priorities right and then yeah. like in week three like other things started happening yeah that we started talking about related to like psychological stuff mm -hmm. so week three came around and i guess like the, you know my instructors very politely you know, nobody made me feel bad but they essentially said we don't think that you're uh moving along at the pace that your classmates are moving and it might be best that if you stop this cohort wait until the next cohort and you know you can start again from there uh, they think that would be beneficial for me and i just kind of let them know that not only am i in the adobe digital academy but I can't waste my time. Yeah. I don't have the the financial uh, leeway to just stop and not have, you know, rent coming in and things like that. So I was like, I need to just go forward and like I learned my learning style. Yeah. I, I never had to really pay attention to my learning style. I told them I was like, if you guys just tell me exactly where I'm deficient, like tell me where I'm not getting it yeah. explicitly, like right now, like explicitly, yeah. A plus. B equals C, you know, yeah. like, and they did that. And I had a, a really good instructor named Justin who sat down with me a few times and Shout just kind of, yeah, <laughs> just went through those things with me. And, you know, once I got them, they clicked. It was like, it was yeah. like a light went off, you did know. Did that cause you to doubt yourself at all? It did. You know, yeah. when you, whenever, like, you know, I was ambitious and excited and you know now you have the people the who are the gatekeepers to like this future that you yeah. see for yourself saying like yeah, i don't know I mean, you yeah. know am i gonna slow take it slower and like yeah. we'll figure it out it was it was a little bit saddening yeah. but you know i'm the type of person where like the that was just fuel just it was just a battery pack not in a like a, a salty type of way yeah. just like all right cool like we're gonna yeah. keep going it's the new task yeah. man like let's get it together like, and so what, what did you about. do what did you do differently from like the learning teaching yourself experience um the second time around or like after you had that conversation um i just made sure that if i didn't understand something i mean to the t like if I couldn't teach it to somebody, then I was asking questions. That yeah. was it. I just increased my my amount of the amount of questions I asked. Yeah, uh, it's so funny that the thing I struggled with was data types, yeah. which is like not hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I, I understood MVC frameworks. I understood like you know the stack that we were using. I understood like how the data flowed through the applications, etc. But I could I could understand like the data yeah. itself. Yeah, I think like as we're going through these different processes like you're going to come in super confidently and different external forces are going to come in and try to get you to doubt mm -hmm. like earlier we talked about like protecting your dreams but sometimes you got to do it even from yourself yeah and like stay in focus so like obviously you know Timor just asked you about how you changed your learning style but like how did you keep your head in the game and stay focused on that dream that you were going for you know to become that software developer over the next few weeks because it wasn't just three weeks how many weeks was it it was oh, like man. three months six months like, yeah so it was a three-month program so 12 weeks and then it was a three-month internship mm -hmm. uh after my internship was over uh there was no headcount on my team but i was doing a great job i was in the middle of my project i need you know they, i wasn't done and my team 
they decided to keep me on board and made me their intern. So I was out of the Adobe Digital Academy internship and into an internship on my team, which is Adobe mm-hmm. Spark. Um, and that was another three months. I was able to finish my project. And in that in that second half of the internship, I was like, man, like anything that I felt like kind of shaky about, I'm going to double down on again. It was like yeah. one of those things where I'm going to ask more questions, ask more questions, like sit down with more people, put more time on people's calendars, like yeah. learn this, get like make sure that you are – proving yourself yeah. you know what i mean and that this investment into you is not for forsaken you know what i mean yeah um and that kind of just turned out well and then i got the the f- official job offer after nice. six months of interning yeah. three months of um training yeah and really like a month before that of like hoping scouting yeah. applying looking for opportunities so this was a overall like a 10 month yeah transition and actually there was a month in there where i was just waiting after the internship was over before i mean after the course was over before the internship started so this is really like a 11 month almost a year-long process of just like just grinding it out being open to any type of transition any type of change that came uh, like a will smith pursuit of happiness moment at the end like how did you feel after that (laughs) offer uh man i cried (laughs) i I literally like when i you know i went home they they pulled me into the office they told me i was happy and then as soon as i got outside i was just crying like you know it was just like this long journey of just like doubting myself and then like asking myself if i was good enough and then having these ups and downs they call them like you know and then eventually just sitting back like man i did that like yeah it was this moment of just like Yes. Sheesh, like, <laughs> I did that. And, and then came the, the next wave of, of imposter syndrome. <laughs> like, oh, fuck, yeah, I, 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 have I have a job. <laughs> <laughs> I can't lose my job now, you know. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's just I know that I can learn. That's the yeah. one thing I kept telling myself. I was like, I'm not stupid. Like, mm-hmm. if anything that you explain to me, I'm going to be able to understand mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And I just have to know where to find the information, know where to find the answers. And then I have to be diligent enough to to double down and like make sure I retain that information, yeah. you know. Did you have any friends in Adobe or mentors or coaches on the outside? Or did your family, your partner, help you? Yeah. You know, well, everyone. Stuff? It was a huge support. Like, I mean, I, as much as the the Adobe Digital Academy gave us uh, us living stipend, it wasn't like you were getting paid a lot of money. So, my brother, my mom, my dad, my sister, everybody. Like, whenever you needed, it was never a lot, but it was always just like right on time. Like, yeah. hey man, I need a, I need a hundred dollars. I need two hundred dollars. You know, whatever it may be, it was always right on time. Yeah. And um, you know, my girlfriend, she was there a lot of the time. Uh, just you know, holding it down, holding it down, yeah. just being, yeah. just being like a uh, understanding that, like, man, I'm I'm really really locked in right now. And, yeah. Like, I need to change my life, yeah. you know, and mm-hmm. she was supportive of that. That was great. Um, and then here, the Adobe Digital Academy gave you, uh, well, paired you with a mentor. So uh, Randy Riggins, who's also, I believe, on the board at uh, Hack the Hood. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, um, yeah, he's been he's been in Adobe. He's a Silicon Valley, like, veteran. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was just very, very supportive of just my mentality. Yeah. You know, I had a technical mentor on my team. That yeah. was, um, shout out to Steve. Uh-huh. <laughs> he, um, he was very helpful the whole way through my internship in terms of, like, technical implementation. Yeah. But when it came down to, like, how I'm feeling, um, you know, imposter syndrome or yeah. mo- being generally motivated and, yeah. and just, or just being f- anxious, afraid or whatever it may be. Uh, Randy was definitely there to just to like always be that voice of reason, always be that uh, comforting wisdom into like, hey, you're doing a good job. I've been speaking to different your managers, et cetera. You're doing good on this. You're doing good on that. Just don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah. Like yeah. We'll make it. It'll it'll yeah. it'll all come together. So he was a great mentor and made me feel comfortable in the space. Yeah. I mean, a question we get a lot is, um, you know, do I need a coding bootcamp? Because like the the information is just online mm-hmm. and offline, and like you can kind of teach yourself on your yeah. own. Like, what kind of response would you give to someone that's like, you know, do I need a bootcamp? And like, right. what what did you get out of the bootcamp versus like if you right. did a self taught bro? Um, you know, one everyone should ask themselves how they learn best. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like a bootcamp for somebody like me was perfect because I had somebody over my shoulder to take that information and fast tracked it into my brain you're like yeah. these are the core competencies that you need to know and if you know these and like they can explain it and then explain it again and explain it again whereas if you're reading something you can't press replay or just ask it again you have to go read it again and read it again so it was just kind of like faster um getting all that information and making sense of it rather than just you know scrubbing the internet and coming up with your own 
uh, understanding of what computer science is or what, de- mm-hmm. what coding and development is yeah. and how you're going to implement it. Like, again, it's a it's an ocean of yeah. jobs. There's so many engineers. Like, yeah. there's quality engineers. There's software engineers. There's uh, computer scientists, et cetera. There's principal scientists. So there's all these different levels of engineering and computer science. And, um, you know, it's yeah. just one of those yeah. things. Yeah. What about career pivots? Like, you've pivoted your career a few times um, you're now like seems like in a happier role like mm-hmm. what advice would you do you have for your younger self when you were I guess picking a major in college like yeah. what um, what do you think you would have done differently I would have went for <laughs> you know it's I don't know whether this is the newfound confidence but I would have went for the hardest thing I can find man I don't I don't even know what I'd be doing I'd probably be like a NASA engineer at this point because <laughs> it's like I've finally realized obviously it took me till I was 25 26 years old that mm-hmm. like I can learn anything I want to learn. You know, yeah. I, I felt limitless in terms of yeah. my mental capacity and what I could retain. Yeah. Um, so going back to my younger self, I would just tell him that and yeah. be like, do what you want. Like, yeah. learn, learn what you want to learn. Like, it yeah. doesn't matter. Like, Since you've noticed different qualities that help you identify these hidden geniuses, mm-hmm. what are the things that you look for on a resume perspective that an algorithm may not be able to detect? Perseverance. Like, you know, that we're on the same topic just somebody who's like either what when they're young or you know older in college whether no matter when it was just like had a daunting idea or desire and executed on it yeah. like that that you, you really can't teach that you know it's like it's not something that you can just put into people you know yeah. some people are just organizers like you guys you guys started your podcast you interviewed your first person and now you've interviewed you know how many interviews have you done so far it's like hundreds of interviews you know what i'm saying yeah it's like you know how many people want to start a podcast yeah you know how many people say they're going to start a podcast yeah you know what i'm saying yeah and it, it's just like you can't put that battery yeah in in some people they just have to have it they have to be able to take that emotion everyone gets emotional about what they want to do yeah but not everybody has the ability to convert that emotion into strategy and then that mm-hmm. strategy into plan and then that plan into action you know into what i mean product and to deliver an organization exactly yeah i love it so you know anyone who can prove that they have that aptitude i believe i mean <laughs> i believe that they can learn how to code yeah. i believe that you can learn the process that goes into building software yeah, you know, yeah. who who do you think should learn how to code? <laughs> so yeah, I guess like what backgrounds, what type of people do you think would do well in these type of roles? I think a lot of small business owners would would be great engineers, especially around niches in their fields. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of people who have the best solutions to problems are the ones who are faced with the problems every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then you have a bunch of engineers that come and solve them. But I feel like. Who who better to work on like the New York City subway, solve the problems of the New York City subway system than the people who are working in the New York City subway yeah. system, like the 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 driver of the train, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. You have to consult that person if you're gonna come up with solutions for their problems. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So who better to create the solutions to their own problems than the people who are in the, yeah. the thick of it? Right? Yeah, and I think that's that's that is a good point, especially for company selection. Like, if you're gonna apply to certain companies, go to the companies where you face those problems, where you really understand it better than a lot of the people that are there already. Yeah, mm-hmm. for so sure. Well, in terms of like skills in general, like what what do you think? Kind of, if you look for the next five to ten years, uh, a lot of people have to change careers, and people always look to learn new things. Mm-hmm. What are some of the skills that you're looking forward to learning, and what do you think is going to be in high demand that people should pay attention to? Um, so right now, in my job, um, the data science and building like data pipelines, mm-hmm. um, it's going to be really big, especially as machine learning uh, is you know it's scaled out and rolled out into everyday products, into different AI softwares. Not to say you need to be an AI yeah. um, dev- engineer, yeah. but like definitely understanding how data is collected, how it's stored, how it's retrieved, how it's used, mm-hmm. how it's analyzed at a high level is something that's not going anywhere. And I think it's becoming like a homestay in the technology space. Yeah. And people who are able to, under, you know, obviously the earlier you get in to a f- particular niche, the better you're going to be at it when it when it's at critical mass, when it's yeah. at super high demand. And yeah. uh, people are hiring people left and right to like, go through their big data or even like create the pipelines for their big data or analyze it, et cetera, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you just pay attention to data in tech companies and what yeah. they're doing with it. And then you can clearly see that that is, it's here already and it's yeah. only going to get more important. Got it. Before going into the lightning round, um, 
now that Adobe Digital Academy has gone from a pilot into something more formalized, what's different now than before? And I think you said there's like 20 people now that are working through the program, or yeah. something like that. I think it's like That's 30 people yeah. or 20 something people who are full time. Yeah. And I think 80 people have come through. And then there's in that number uh, yeah. that isn't full time and that have yeah. come through, there's a group of them currently interning yeah and currently don't in quote the program. us on that like liz will can correct you <laughs> yeah that, like but that's i don't like want to i don't want to give the numbers estimates or right like these that. are high level like, estimates for sure yeah. <laughs> and how does someone apply what does that process look like um so we have partners so general assembly is the partner i think that they've expanded it to a few more boot camps i don't want to name them because yeah, yeah. i don't remember exactly yeah. Um, but basically any one of our partner programs, you apply through their coursework and you get, you get into their, their course and then you can apply to the Adobe digital Academy directly through our partners. Yeah. It's like I applied to the, uh, um, opportunity fund through general assembly and I can let them know that I'm interested in the Adobe digital Academy. Um, and I'm pretty sure through our other partners, it's something sim similar to that process. Yeah. So when you, uh, w folks are listening, when you're applying to a boot camp, also find out what companies they work with and what scholarships and opportunity funds they are. Absolutely. Because then you could also uh, kind of secure an internship or an apprenticeship yeah. when you graduate if you just like ask the right questions. Exactly. Yeah. Just be inquisitive. Yeah. And one last um, point around that. Also do your research and realize that it's just people making these decisions and if you can write a compelling story, like why you want to learn how to mm -hmm. code, like what have you done today that like where you persevered and you can just demonstrate that you're someone who's driven, they'll make it happen for you. They'll figure out a way to accept you or they tell you about other opportunities. So just definitely do your research and uh, get as many people to advise you as possible. Right. It's kind of like like children, right? Not to say that we're grown children, but imagine like a child, right? You, mm -hmm. you, the ones that you think have the highest, but the most potential, the most inquisitive, the most energetic, um, the, they're putting themselves out there, right? And like, wow, this person has a high potential. Like, I don't, they're a blank canvas. They don't know anything right now, but yeah. I can take that person and I can teach Save them and them. show them and, and like mm -hmm. draw, steer that energy into the right ways, right? Yeah. Or the positive ways. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same with, um, I think, learning how to code. It's like, yeah. I, I like that energy. I like that drive. I like the, you know, you, obviously you're competent. You have, you think critically. I know that I can take that and mold you into an engineer. And help them become the best version of themselves. Yeah. So at this point in the podcast, we do the lightning round. And this is where we ask you questions. But our listeners want to know any strategies, any resources, um, any tactics that you've used to where you, uh, that helped you get to where you are today. Um, so Archer, take it away. Yeah. So imagine you just moved to a brand new city. You don't know anyone and you only have $100 mm -hmm. and you're trying to get back on your feet and break into tech. What would you do and how would you spend that $100? If I didn't know anybody and I had $100 and I needed to get on my feet and break into tech. Yeah. And I only have $100. <laughs> well, okay. So with $100, what I would do is... I would go on the internet, find all the free resources I can find. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, obviously realizing my financial limitation, realize that that's all I have available to me. I would double down, double down, double down, pound that information into my brain as much as I can. Mm -hmm. And then I'd take the $100 and pay to go to either a conference or a workshop of some sort with that are like a hiring event or maybe even like there's accelerators that are looking for people, et cetera. And I just pay, use that hundred dollars to get access mm -hmm. to the people. And when I'm in that room, I'll just shoot my, my best shots at like, Hey, like I'm Amir Brown. I have just learned X, Y, and Z on my own. These are the things that I've been doing. I just spent my last $100 to get in this room. I came in this room because I'm here to get a job or I'm here yeah. to get an opportunity. And like, if you know anybody or if you know any opportunities that you could push my way, please do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, that's, that's raw energy. That's passion. Yeah. Um, and you know, we, we talked a little bit about what it takes to make it all the way in. And I'm kind of like you were like, if people tell me I can't do something, it motivates me more. Mm -hmm. But I do get sick and tired of things that people tell me. You talked a little bit about things that you're sick and tired of. Right. So, like, can you talk about what you're sick and tired of and how you what your response is to that? Right. I was sick and tired of um, just letting my environment or my experiences dictate what my future will be. Um, or other people's opinions of me or other people's opinions of uh, what I do or what I, you know, what my, what my interests are, et cetera. Yeah. Like letting that box me into a trajectory that, you know, wasn't mine. It was outlined by forces outside of me. Yeah. And I was just sick and tired of living that way. And yeah. I decided that, you know, I want what I want is important. 
Yeah. And I want to learn how to code. I yeah. want to become an engineer. I want to have my own tech products one day. I want to liberate my life. I want to increase my salary. I want to have stock options. You know, these yeah. are things like I want them. So I'm going to take the steps that I think are appropriate to make that happen. Yeah. Now, if I fall, I fall. If yeah. I fly, I fly. Yeah. But like, even that is ownership. Yeah. Like if I fell, but I own that step yeah. and I can sit here on this ground and yeah. be okay with that. And I know that I've been on this ground before. Yeah. I can take another step until yeah. I can, you know. And if you fall, like you're going to learn from that fall. You're going to do learn. it again. And keep yep. going. You're going to learn. Yeah. yeah. And it's a tough, it's like, you know, if you ever like getting, had a, been in a bad relationship, mm -hmm. but it's like, you know, in the moment, it's like, dang, this is, this is terrible. This is emotionally <laughs> draining. And then later on, when you're in a great relationship, you're like, man, I learned a lot about myself out of yeah. that bad time. And like, yeah. you know, I've, I figured out who I am, what I like, what I don't like, what I have to give, what I don't have to give. Like Sometimes I was contributed to you know, the emotional drainage. Like, you know, it's like a lot of stuff. exactly. You yeah. learn, you learn about yourself. So, yeah. Yeah. Man. Yeah. What about um, giving advice to uh, someone who is uh, maybe like a few weeks or a few months uh, into the process of learning how to code? We know that that's probably the moment when a lot of people give up. Mm -hmm. So for someone who is, l let's pretend like someone who's listening, they're about to give up because they're feeling like it's challenging right. and, and they're uh, getting stuck. What, what do you have to say to them? Take your curriculum or take whatever you're learning from. Go to the people who are assessing your skills at that moment. Sit down with them. Be very candid with them. Ask them to redline what you do not know. Ask them to quiz you. Ask them to point out the whole, poke the holes in what I do not know mm -hmm. and tell them to teach it to you directly. Yeah. Um, do not give up because you're awake. Even just being in the room trying, you're so much closer than like a lot of people were. Like if you would have, what, in 2000, what, 2006, I was 16. If in 2007 you would have decided that you were going to become an engineer and that's what you were going to do and nothing was going to stop you. You would have been nine years ahead of me. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, and I wish that I can go back to 16 year old me and say like, yeah. Oh, you want to, Oh, you like that movie? You like, you like t software? Yeah. Oh, you don't know any software engineers. That's fine. Go figure it out. Go figure out how, mm -hmm. w what one needs to do to learn how to build an app. Like you're drawing on a piece of paper, you're writing out your ideas. What's the next step for that? Yeah. Like move forward. You have the knowledge in front of you to, change your predicament or to like double down on what your ideas are like it's yeah. all right there yeah yeah and um we talked a little bit earlier about music we talked about um illmatic stillmatic new york state of mind mm -hmm. uh, what kind of music do you listen to to um motivate you to keep you you know focused to help right. you grind um or like what what kind of arts things help you like get Right. Focus. I like listening to music of about the underdog. Not yeah. necessarily like braggadocious. I mean, like yeah. we all listen to like a rap, yeah. rap trap, etc. But like, yeah. I really like songs that are like, we made it. Like, yeah. you know, I really like songs that are like, look at where we are. You know, like yeah. they give you that feel yeah. because it's like it lets me know like how far I've come, but yeah. it also like motivates me to get Keep even on. further. Like, you know, like I just want to go as far as I possibly can with this. Like, and it's not a to me, it's not like a. It's not a lose if like this is if this is where I go and I plateau yeah. here and this is like my life and this yeah. is the, the life I've built for myself. It's yeah. a great life. Like yeah. I'm 28 years old. Like yeah. I don't have any kids. I'm, I, I plan on being married one day. Yeah. It's like I can move forward with this. So yeah. just being grateful for what is yeah. and being excited for what's to come. Yeah, never getting comfortable. Yep, I like it. I like it. Um, as far as family's concerned, I see you got it tatted on your arm. We mm -hmm. talked about your brother. Um, Talk about your family. Like, how's your family feel about this process? You talked about your partner. How's your partner yeah. feel about this process? Man, they're just their proud. struggles. Yeah, they're just proud. Um, there were struggles. There were struggles. Uh, <laughs> like, when I quit my job, yeah. <laughs> my, my mom, she was like, yeah, you know, just uh, why don't you just come home and stay here for a little bit and, like, we'll figure it out. And I was like, oh, no, I didn't quit my job to come home. I quit my job to go forward. You know, yeah, I quit my yeah. job to fly. So, go like, West, young man. yeah. So, you know, even that was a little moment where, not to say she doubted me, but even then, right? Like one, my biggest supporter in That's the love. world w was suggesting the safer route, the yeah. mm -hmm. what seems to be more like you know, yeah, reasonable at the yeah. time versus me being like, nah, just help me with one month's rent and you you won't have to help me with rent again. Yeah. But, you know, like yeah. that was it. Yeah. Like just yeah. one month. That's all I need. Yeah. If I was if I was like going to work and coming home tired and still trying to think about what I can and can't do. Like now I don't have, to, I have all day, every day for 30 days, I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And you know, by the middle of that month, I was 
doing the pre-work for General Assembly, got accepted to General Assembly, et cetera, yeah. you know. So that was a little, you know, a hard part with my family. Um, just them kind of being worried, like yeah. when people quit their jobs sporadically, yeah. you're either yeah. having a breakdown or yeah. a breakthrough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you all, you also talked about, about time, yeah. your time. Like, how do you think about time? I mean, I know you got, now you've gone from, you know, making what you were making in New York to making what you're making now, which is, gives you this lifestyle, which mm -hmm. is great. But you seem like somebody that's way deeper than money. Yeah. Like, time is a very important thing for you to think about. So how do you think about time? And how should other people that are listening think about time? Man, you, time is so precious, man. Like, we have one life. You have to you have to live it to what you consider is the fullest for yourself. You know, like time to me is precious, precious. Uh, it's not just in terms of like development and like you know what you can do with the time. It's just like how it's spent in general, right? Yeah. Like I'd way rather spend my time sitting with my good friends and my family than sitting by myself. You know, me personally, yeah. it's just like you don't you can't get those moments back. Um, so when I think about the future, I'm I think all of us are. In a not a race, but in a, on a journey to reclaim our time completely. Mm -hmm. I I want to work. I want to innovate. I want to build. I want to see things happen. I want to spend time like in the world, but I want to do it the way I want to do it. And that's mm -hmm. you know they say that's a millennial uh, entitled idea that like the world is just something that you get to mold to yourself. Like I thoroughly like reject that idea that yeah. you have to conform in some way there's there's gonna give give there's gonna be like places you have to give um i don't agree yeah. i don't agree at all yeah. i think that i can spend every single day thinking about and building the things that i want or learning the things i need to learn to f to build what i want to build in the future like it's yeah. all it's all geared towards what i consider is like what will be liberation from everything yeah <laughs> and at the end of the day like you have the agency to change your circumstance and it comes down to you like if you don't have what you want to have now look around maybe it's your friends that you surround yourself with maybe it's your family like doesn't mean forget about your friends or forget about your family but you are the average of the five people that you surround yourself mm -hmm. with so if you want to be someone else then that's probably the first thing you'll have to figure out how to change that yeah. where you spend your time who you spend it with and it's not a knock to people who are not on that journey with you or don't see the vision that you see or just you know it just isn't their journey it's not a knock to them but you know they have to understand that you have to live your life and you have to fulfill yourself and that when you get to wherever you're going whether it's the promised land or somewhere in between like it's it's to make you happy so if you're my friend and you're my family you have to understand that I'm living my journey. And if that means some of my time isn't available to do the things we used to do, mm -hmm. that's just what it is because y you support my goal. You support where I want to go with my life the same way I would do for you. You know, yeah. I like, yeah. the, I like the, the, we are on a journey to reclaim our time. Um, and a question that I have for you is like, let's pretend that like if in a world where money didn't exist, mm -hmm. how would you exchange value with people? In the money, where you know, it's funny. I was just talking earlier about a world with no money, uh -huh. and I, I think that it would just be, it would be a moment. I think our whole society would have a moment of introspection. Yeah. I don't think we know. Yeah, I think we literally are programmed and designed to work. You know, yeah. like to not to work, like in the sense of what I was saying, where I want to build my ideas, but to work to contribute yeah. to the overall system. And you know, if there was no money, then like, what are you contributing to? Yeah. So I think people would exchange ideas. I think people would exchange um, thoughts about who they are. People would talk a lot more about the spiritual and metaphysical uh, realm than like the, you know, the physical realm and what we're doing here, what the objective here is, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and we'd learn more about humanity. Like people would, there'd be a, I think there'd be a lot more love in the world yeah. if there was no need to acquire, yeah. you know? Yeah, uh, I have this idea that nothing in the world really costs money anyway, yeah. because it's all sourced from natural, uh, naturally occurring or synthetic uh, materials that come from the earth in some way, shape, or form. Like yeah. no one snaps their fingers and out comes this chemical that you use, you know, yeah. or out comes this material that you use. It's all sourced. So if I think people will start exchanging ideas, yeah, if I can give you the idea to build a machine to pull coal out the ground and that machine is made from natural resources of some sort, then technically none of that costs anything. Yeah. The, the, the machine, the only thing that cost was, the, was the, the spark of genius. Yeah. And once it's given to the world, those things can be used to automate things that we spend money on currently. Love it. Love it. And what's the best way to stay in touch with you? 
uh, you know, you can catch me on Instagram, Nino yeah. Breeze. That's hey. my uh, that's my party promotion <laughs> name. You know, I, I started that name when I was in high school. Yeah. <laughs> and then when Instagram came out in college, I used it again. And I was like, you know, what? I don't care what I do in this world. I'm going to keep Nino Breeze, oh, yeah. man. <laughs> cool, man. Yeah. So we're, we're excited, man. Thank you for, for joining us on the podcast. Um, hopefully we'll organize something together in Chicago soon, even here in the Bay. Um, and we know that we're going to see a lot uh, more from you in the future. And without further ado, let's yeah. break in. Let's break in. Thanks, Thanks a lot, bro. Thanks for having me.